So uh, I'm just going to start off the presentation by talking about, uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to make any challenges this week and neither were any of our contributors just because uh, this week we're super swamped with projects and assignments. I, it's just all seems to line up and uh, finals are coming up here. So everyone's studying. So it's tricky, but there are still challenges that I know people haven't solved. So please go check them out. Uh, they're in the channel under current challenges on the left hand side and uh, I've also created a challenges help room channel um, that you could go check out just in case uh, you need help with that or let's say you don't even know where to get started with a challenge you can go in there and request help and uh, one of us will come in to give you some hints as to how to get started. Um, another thing I really want to encourage because uh, one of the biggest benefits to even being part of a club like this is the networking opportunities that are, that are available. Um, and there's a community in Edmonton here called Yegsec. Um, and they're, they're focused all around tech and info security, all that kind of stuff. And there's all kinds of people from the community that are in there. Um, there's people in there that work at all kinds of uh, cybersecurity companies, some people that work at software development companies, um, just big, big Edmonton figures. And so it's really important. Well, it's just a great opportunity for you to go in there and meet some new people um, and potentially uh, build up your, your business network or, or just uh, friends, honestly. Um, so I'd recommend that. I can post the link uh, afterwards if people want it. Um, maybe I'll do that anyways, just so that you just have that available to you. So uh, another thing I want to bring up is that uh, Try Hack Me is doing their advent of cyber. Um, so it's their Christmas capture the flag event and uh, I'll actually show you the website for it. It's right here. So they're doing advent of cyber. Um, it's free. So you can come in and apparently there's $19,000 worth of prizes. And that's pretty crazy. Um, there's all kinds of sponsors for it like CompTIA, uh, offensive security port swigger, BL security and try hacking themselves. If you've never done a CTF, it's usually composed of a few different categories. And we've talked about a little bit of OSINT ourselves uh, in our club here. Um, we haven't really done any web exploitation or network exploitation. I guess the only thing we've done really so far, because the club's pretty young, is we've done some open source stuff. Um, but I'd recommend just at least giving it a shot. You never know where 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 it'll go and what kind of things uh, could come from it. Um, so that one's going on. Uh, Hack the Box is also doing a um, a CTF right now. They're doing their Christmas event. Uh, I'll just see if I can potentially bring that up for you guys right now so you can see it. Um, nah, I, I won't bring it up. But I, the link is still in the upcoming events Discord uh, on the side there. And so please check that out as well. Um, and then, so I've been in contact with the University of Calgary. Um, they have an awesome InfoSec club down there uh, with hundreds of members. They're very big, they're very established, and they are doing their uh, Capture the Flag event, um, the Magpie CTF. And that is also posted in the upcoming events channel. And that was posted by Stebman Core. And I'm grateful he did that. Okay, uh, another thing too, there's a huge sale on hacking books on Humble Bundle. If you're at all interested, check it out. There's some great books in there. I've been through a couple of them myself. I read extensively in the uh, malware analysis book and had a lot of fun with that. Uh, I also, I think they have a game hacking one on there. And that one is super interesting too, because that's just like, breaking down that that game of catch or of, of, uh, of cat and mouse that happens between hackers and uh, game developers and it's just it's kind of fun to to get into that um i also don't condone hacking video games because that's technically a bad thing to do and then uh all right so another thing to mention this is club specific to us um we're having a, an election for the VP external role, there's two candidates that have come forward, um, Aaron and Rashab. Uh, I'll be posting their campaign write-ups later today or tomorrow once they're just totally finalized. Um, the election will take place on Monday starting at 10 a.m. and will close Tuesday at 12 p.m. And then I will announce the new VP external by Tuesday evening. 
So one thing I'll say uh, about Rashab and Aaron is that they're both awesome dudes. They're super qualified. Um, they're both pretty passionate. So it's totally up to you guys who you would like for the VP external role. Uh, and please vote and encourage other people to read the platforms and vote as well who are members of the club. Okay, so I hope that wasn't too much. I just really wanted to share that stuff. Uh, so that being said, let's get started with this week's presentation. So we're going to be talking about uh, setting up your hacking environment this week. Um, a few people have voiced interest in this. Um, it's it's honestly super important to have some kind of a an environment for you to have tools available um, to dissect files, to uh, perform network analysis, to perform scanning, uh, all that kind of stuff. And so thankfully, people have gotten together and formed uh, hacking operating systems and made them read readily available and free for us to use. So they're just these crazy, powerful resources for us. Um, and we're going to learn how to set them up today. So what I want to kind of talk about before we get into virtual machines and setting up Kali Linux as a virtual box machine today is uh, a home lab. So if you're not familiar with home labs, um, it's basically like just getting spare technology, like old laptops, old server uh, racks, that kind of stuff, and connecting it in your home, in your basement somewhere, I don't know in a room and uh, setting it up as a virtual or not a virtual network, but a physical network. Uh, as you can see here, some, these are some examples of some home labs. They're pretty hardcore. I guess I could have picked a pretty simple one. Like mine's really simple. I have a home lab here too. Uh, mine just consists of a laptop that I run a whole bunch of Docker machines on. Uh, and I also host our discord server from my home lab. So that's another cool thing or not the discord server, but the discord bot the eh.support bot. I host that from my uh, home lab. So one thing, if you're interested in security at all, I totally recommend you get started with some kind of a home lab. And today with our virtual machines, that's one of the things we're going to be doing is getting started with a virtual lab in the most lightweight and free and less invasive way possible. Um, and that starts with platforms like VirtualBox and VMware. So from here, um, Aaron, who's actually one of the candidates for the v VP external role, he will uh, take it from here in the presentation. So Aaron, I'll hand it off to you. Perfect. All right. Thank you, Taylor. Um, so yeah, so mm -hmm. nice thing is here. Um, just give me one second, actually, just to bring that back up here. Should be able to see that now. And if someone can just confirm for me that they can see that. Yeah, you're good. Perfect. Yeah. Alrighty, thank you. Alrighty, so first off, um, VirtualBox um, currently right now is going to be the romantic recommended platform um, that we are going to um, obviously go for. Um, biggest reasons for that is it's just simply uh, very easy to set up and very easy to use. Um, we have a link. Um, these slides also will be posted, obviously, uh, at the end along with the video. Um, but the link basically to go directly to the download. Um, and then quite simply, all you're going to have to do is just choose um, from the website, similar to how you could see kind of set up here, um, just simply what operating system uh, it, your computer uses. Now, from there, um, installing it um, is actually also pretty easy as well. Um, for the most part, it's just kind of clicking the next, um, the accept, just very basic stuff. There really isn't a whole lot you need to change with the installation unless you want to move specifically the environment to be on a, a specific drive or anything like that. Um, the one thing to note when setting up VirtualBox, though, is uh, it might impact your network connection. Um, it was something that uh, I did get a warning at the very end, and I was kind of curious. So I just had uh, some YouTube playing, some streams playing just on my other monitor, just to kind of see actually how it was. Um, and I did uh, notice that I was constantly losing connection. So if you are doing something that does require consistent internet usage, maybe just delay um, doing the final step of the installation, just until obviously whatever you're taking care of is done. 
Um, and then from there, obviously, you can install it on your computer. So let's talk about Kali Linux. So obviously, when it comes to downloading your, uh, your virtual machine, um, that itself is set up, but you actually need to get an image for your machine itself. Uh, so the first thing you need to know is if your computer is a 32-bit or a 64-bit computer. Um, now, honestly, there's a very, very unlikely chance that uh, your computer is going to be a 30-bit com uh, computer. Um, most of those are kind of just older computers, a lot of ones that you don't really see throughout a lot of rotations of sales. Um, but I will show just on the next, uh, next slide here basically where you can check that. Um, so for PCs, obviously, you have system information that you can just search at the very bottom on your search bar. Um, and then just under system type, it will tell you um, x64 bit or x32 bit. And then as for the Mac, um, at the top left of your Mac, um, you'll always have the, the Apple icon. It'll be under about this Mac. Now, the Mac is a little bit a little bit tougher to understand, um, mostly just because it is going to be based upon uh, the actual processor rather than just, you know, a convenient thing that's going to say system type. Um, again, that itself I'll show in just a second here, but obviously from there, once you've determined um, what type of uh, computer it is, um, just simply you just need to download it and it should, uh, it should download as a .ova file. Now, as I was mentioning, um, so just kind of as a couple um, examples here. So if you're on a PC or a, a PC computer, um, it should just show similar up at the top here. So the x64, x32 based computer. Um, but as I mentioned, with the Mac itself, um, it is going to be based upon uh, which processor you do have. Um, so on this slide itself, um, we just put a little bit of a guide just so that you can actually cross-reference um, just to see which, uh, which processor you do have. And then obviously, if you are on an older computer, one being the Intel Core Solo or Duo, um, you may be required to use the 30-bit download, or 32-bit download, my apologies. Now, installing Kali Linux on your virtual machine. Um, this itself, again, is actually quite simple. Um, when it comes to after you completed the download, you have your .ova file. Um, all you're wanting to do is you just want to move it out of your downloads just into its own file, um, just so that's kind of separate from everything else. Um, and just very simply double click on the file. Um, it'll bring up the installation guide. Um, again, it's just clicking next and agree to everything and Automatically, it should open up VirtualBox, and you should see uh, the actual uh, the actual image for Kali Linux right there. Um, from there, though, um, I just want to say first off a little bit about my own experience. So, for me personally, I am a computer science student, student, but I am a little bit earlier in my degree. I haven't gone through a lot of how to use vi uh, virtual machines or anything like that before. So, just a couple things that I learned. So when I initially did do my installation, um, I tried opening it up and was getting an error, the same error that you see on the right side there. Now, if you have not previously used a virtual machine, um, you may be required to do an extra step, and that is to enable virtualization on your computer. Uh, this itself is going to vary computer to computer for how you will set this up and will require you to access your system's BIOS. Now, when it comes to that, if you are unsure of kind of how to access your system BIOS or um, obviously just how to actually change it itself. Um, the best advice we can give, um, it's something Taylor even kind of gave to me, is just simply how to enable virtualization and then just put in your make and model of your computer. Um, as I mentioned, um, that itself can vary um, quite literally from just like an, uh, an MSI to uh, an ASUS or anything like that. So. Um, additionally, the other thing that I also had uh, run into personally is I have a custom build for a computer. Um, so if you are also um, in the situation where you do have a custom build, um, you just will want to search based upon what type of motherboard you have. Now, when it comes to obviously this way itself, um, that itself is just one way. The nice thing about Kali Linux is there are tons and tons of options that you can actually use um, to be able to put it onto your computer. Um, additionally, we do have a document that does kind of list a couple, but that itself, obviously, we could be talking uh, talking for hours at that point if we just kind of 
wanted to go through every single option, but obviously this was just kind of a simple tutorial for a beginner setup. Um, one of those things were obviously, like I said, I had no previous experience going into it, and I found that uh, other than basically that uh, bio step, I was able to do it very simply. Um, no issues myself. Um, but if you did want to see other ways, um, we do have a link right there. Um, by all means, uh, feel free to explore. Um, it'll break down into the different ways from there. Perfect. And that is it for VirtualBox. So I can pass that back to you, Taylor. Right on. Thank you so much, Aaron. Um, so I'll just share my screen again. Because uh, we had a another I don't know if I guess you can probably see that Let's close that off so uh, Rashab who is the other candidate for how do I present on this <laughs> slideshow from beginning I think it's in view never mind Okay, there we go. Oops. Okay, so uh, Rashab, who's the other candidate for VP External, he wrote up these slides, and I haven't uh, gone in depth in them, but basically they'll cover uh, VMware versus versus VirtualBox. Now, I I haven't really used VMware that much. Um, also, originally, Rashad was going to be giving this this part of the presentation, and he was unable to make it because he's got uh, he's got a big project to finish up here. So, I'll just be kind of briefly covering this, and then I'll post the slides afterwards for those who want to explore the VMware option. So, VirtualBox, we just went over that. Uh, VMware is basically uh, an alternative platform for hosting virtual machines. Um, the th I think the big difference between uh, VMware and VirtualBox is that VirtualBox is uh, made by Oracle and is more of just like a, a one-stop for your virtual machine needs, whereas VMware has licensing options and uh, the, like the option to turn it into kind of an enterprise virtual machine solution. Um, so it expands more for like business and corporate use of virtual machines as far as I'm aware, and I hope that I'm not butchering that. Um, yeah, so we'll just skip that for now. Yep, so uh, there you have lots of options as to the kind of the machines that you can virtualize through these platforms. Um, in this case, Rashab listed, uh, um, I guess that you can install them on those. I'm just going to skip that. So snapshots, it's another important thing to mention. Um, VMware and VirtualBox, you're able to kind of take a, a, a save of the virtual machine and then restore the virtual machine back from that save. And that's what snapshots kind of allow you to do. Um, licensing that I was talking about earlier with uh, VMware. So I think in the next slide, yeah, so he's got a picture here. So VirtualBox, always free. VMware Workstation Player is the free version that um, someone like us would download and use and, and uh, download uh, VMs for. Uh, but then you have those alternative uh, li licensing options for VMware. So I don't know if you ever start a business in the future and need some kind of virtualization platform, you can definitely check that out. Um, oh yeah, VirtualBox is open source as well. So that's really cool. If you ever want to take a look under the hood, that's what the open source really lets you do. Okay, so it looks like he said here that if performance is a key factor for your specific use case, investing in the VMware license would be a more rational choice. Uh, 
that they run faster than their virtual box counterparts and that this difference may not be no as noticeable on a smaller scale so probably on our scale it's not as noticeable but in enterprise projects it's much more noticeable so that's probably the big pro for vmware versus virtual box awesome so i will post those slides for you guys as well if you want to check them out and for the time being, our workshop today involves installing VirtualBox on your machine if you have not done so already. So Aaron and I will stick around here for a bit to help you guys out with uh, getting your VirtualBox installed. Um, if it's VMware, I will learn it with you. <laughs> All right, let me know if you have any questions.